Greetings, everybody. We're just getting settled. Let's give each other a few minutes to uh, admit, admit everyone. Good morning. You have joined uh, Seed and Plant Pathology of Common Northeast Seed Crops. It's going to be a great session. This is officially the, if all the other sessions weren't the nerding out, let the nerding out begin. Um, we're really joined by some great experts uh, today. And my name is Heron Breen. I'll be joining Emily Stark as a moderator. We also have uh, Anna, Mah Anna Muhammad as our uh, doing the boards today as our Zoom DJ. Anna, you want to say hello? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And yes, I'll be nerding out right with you behind the scenes. So enjoy the, the workshop. Cool. So as you we've come to expect, we have a little bit of an intro that we do. And um, bear with us. We're going to go through some slides just to set the, the tone here. So yes, welcome everybody. Um, you've chosen to join us for this wonderful workshop today. And this is a, a wonderful collaboration between the NOFA Winter Conference, NOFA New York Winter Conference and the Northeast Organic Seed Conference. We get to uh, come together every couple of years and uh, you're participating in the third such collaboration. Uh, my name is Heron Breen. I live up here in central Maine in St. Albans. I have a day job over at the Fedco Seeds and I also uh, have a farm where I do various things, seed work prim prim primarily. Uh, you know, you're looking at, um, or the community agreements. So these are the different ways that we're hoping to use Zoom platform in a respectful and mindful way. There's a couple things that we all need to just bear in mind. And uh, one of those is avoiding jargon. This session will probably have a lot of that. Um, but our presenters are going to do their best to kind of unwind un untangle some of that. Um, also, this one mic concept that if we are uh, on just one person speaking at a time, that would be great. Definitely the raise hand function is down in your reactions mode, generally on your toolbar, star nine for those of us who would be on the phone. And also just be patient with us. Uh, Zoom is, uh, I'm not sure if there's a Zoom God or Zoom gods, if it's a polytheistic religion. Um, we, I may have offended some of them, so we never know what kind of things are going to occur. Just be patient. If a speaker goes belly up or if I go belly up, we'll just log in and folks will just keep going. Next slide. We'd like to take a moment. Uh, and acknowledge that we are, each of us, on land that is managed, was managed, lived with, and lived on before and after European colonization. Uh, please take a moment to reflect upon where you are in this moment. If you know what indigenous community lived or lives with the land where you are right now, feel free to acknowledge that in the chat. If you want to learn more, there's a helpful website link on the slide that expands to not only the North America, but honestly the whole world to show the indigenous communities and what land they take care of. Let us take a moment of silence, uh, of prayer, of respectful mindfulness. Thank you. And uh, where I live is Wabanaki territory. Next slide. We're also really thankful to be able to offer the resources of the In Living Color virtual Black Indigenous person of color space during these conferences. Um, we wanna give our uh, thanks to facilitators, Amanda David and Madonna Bushi, who are available 24 seven via email and uh, are having basically the equivalent of office hours at this wonderful virtual space. So if you 
are looking for any kind of help or community, please contact the folks on the screen. Next slide. We have some wonderful keynote speakers this week. Laura Lengnick already spoke on Saturday and is available as a recording. And uh, Banu Subramaniam is speaking on Thursday and Brian Caldwell on Saturday. So mark those on your calendar. This is good stuff. Next slide. We have some University of Vermont note takers uh, with us today. If any of those folks are here and want to acknowledge themselves in the chat, that would be great. Uh, these folks are working on taking notes that will help us identify our priorities, our opportunities, our challenges. This is all part of a needs assessment that's going to take place this coming Sunday, the 24th, which is a free event that's kind of a post-conference event. Uh, these note takers are going to actually be putting a link in the chat uh, about sharing kind of where you are. They're trying to do a little map of the Northeast organic seed community. So you'll see that in a second. Next slide. This needs assessment day I spoke of is a three portion uh, day. And really it's, its intention is to help us brainstorm together to build a more resilient community. Part of what we're facing in our reality today is really not just that does it need to set new places at the table, but maybe build a whole new table. So this is a day where those of us working with seed in the region have an opportunity to work together. Hannah Tragis and Jackie Pilati, who you've seen as moderators throughout this, uh, this week already, will be leading that day. And we really want you to join us. There's going to be a way to access that. It's not through the Socio platform. It's a post-conference event. And that's through the free session link that the UVM folks have put up. Now that free session link has a whole bunch of sessions that folks can access uh, for free who have not paid for registration. The needs assessment being something for all of us, no matter whether we paid or not. Uh, so feel free to go in there and take a look at that. Next slide. Well, here we are. I'm gonna hand this over to my co-moderator uh, Emily Stark to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Emily. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Stark, and I work at the breeding department at Johnny's. Um, and I am very excited for this talk this morning. And I'm welcoming Lindsay Dutoy, Allison Smart, and Sh Sue Chef Shoifley. Sorry, Sue. <laughs> um, with their expertise. Uh, so Lindsay is the vegetable seed pathologist and professor and extension plant pathology, pathologist at University of Washington State. Um, Sue is the vegetable specialist extraordinaire that I have known for a bunch of years and I'm excited to see her in this capacity. Uh, she works at the UMass Extension and Allison Smart is someone who I have sent many, many rotten squash samples to and I appreciate all of the work that she's done. Uh, she is the plant pathologist uh, and director of plant disease diagnostic lab at UMaine. Uh, so welcome all of you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for everyone attending. Uh, and I guess we're going to kick it off with Lindsay. Yeah, one thing I forgot, I want to paste into the chat. Um, there's going to be a free social hour that the Society of Organic uh, Seed Professionals will be hosting on Thursday evening. And I'll put that in the chat for folks that want to join. Sorry, Lindsay, you go right ahead. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Can you all see the slides? We get a nod or a thumbs up would be great. Wonderful. Darn, darn Thank tootin'. you so much, Heron, and, and um, everyone who's uh, responsible for putting this together. It's um, sorry we cannot meet in person, but um, it's wonderful to be able to share with you. And I uh, do want to acknowledge that um, I reside and work in the area of the um, Swinomish uh, tribe in, in the Northwest. So, um, and appreciate the opportunity to, to be on this wonderful land. And um, as, as was mentioned earlier, I work for uh, Washington State University with a focus on vegetable seed crop uh, pathology for, for the Northwest USA. And Heron asked me if I would focus today on, on diseases that affect brassica seed production. Um, he also said if I have time to throw in a few allium <laughs> diseases, but um, as, I, as I look at, um, let's see if I can, sorry, move to the next slide. There we go. 
if you look at this book called The Compendium of Brassica Diseases, which is sort of a nightmare if you're a brassica grower, and <laughs> nothing to read before you go to bed, there's a long list of all the various uh, uh, pathogens that can plague your, your brassica seed crops. It's a long list, and to try and cover these with any justice in, in 15 minutes is, is not fair um, <laughs> on the diseases, if, if you don't mind me anthropomorphizing them. But I, I've highlighted in green some of the key ones that can be problematic when it comes to potential infection of seed. And, and in particular today, I'll, I'll be talking about black leg, uh, which is a fungal disease. Um, it also causes, the pathogen also causes a disease called former stem canker, depending on the symptoms you look at, and black rot, uh, which is a bacterial disease, because these two have very significant consequences if you are in the business of producing and, and distributing seed. So these two pathogens are actually of quarantine status in many areas um, of seed production because um, they are very, very readily seed borne and very readily seed transmitted. So the idea is to try and keep your seed production area as clean as possible from of these pathogens. So on the left-hand side of the slide, I show a picture of a, a cabbage seed um, it, that has been incubated in, in a moist environment and the fungus has started to form its little black fruiting bodies on the seed and, and it oozes out these um, pink masses of spores. And the lower picture is a, the hypocotyl of a young uh, brassica seedling showing the um, fungus developing on the hypocotyl and producing these fruiting bodies with the, the masses of pink spores that ooze out. Um, it, it's quite pretty if you like color, but um, obviously as a, patho as a grower, you probably don't want to be seeing this. On the right hand side is um, are two photos of symptoms of black rot, which is a bacterial disease. The pathogen is Xanthomonas campestris, pathovar campestris, it's a mouthful. But I think the key thing to realize is that black rot and black leg are two very, very different diseases, both significant with respect to seed. Um, black leg is caused by former lingam, black, which is a fungus. Black rot is a bacterium. And black leg um, is called that, that name black leg because um, as brassica plants that are mature um, and, and flowering, uh, develop and get infected, very often the, the base of the stem turns black from a canker that forms, so that's hence the name black leg. On the left-hand side of this slide, you can see a young seedling that we grew out um, in the greenhouse from an infected seed lot, and the base of the seedling, I'm not sure if you can see these tiny pinprick size black structures, those are uh, fruiting bodies of the fungus forming at the base of the stem. Um, at where it's emerged from, from the, the, in this case, potting medium in a greenhouse. And the top uh, figure again shows, um, this is actually a sample that I received from an organic seed grower that ended up unfortunately with this disease in their crop and the material that arrived to me was dead. And when I incubated a moist chamber, lo and behold, you can see all the fruiting bodies start to ooze out this pink uh, tendril of, of spore masses. Probably the most common symptom you'll encounter as a grower, if you are unfortunate enough to encounter this disease is, is the leaf spot phase. So the middle lower picture shows a uh, classic uh, dead uh, leaf spot with lots of these little black fruiting bodies. And because it was very rainy when I looked at the sample out in the field, um, those fruiting bodies were actually oozing. And if I zoomed in on this, you'd see a pinkish tinge to this um, wet um, um, surface of the leaf because of how much those spores are oozing out, like kind of like squeezing a toothpaste tube. And there on the right, again, there's the fungus on the seed. And this pathogen, the black leg pathogen, does very well in cool, wet conditions. And unfortunately, in the Northwest, which is a very, very important area of brassica seed production, uh, we have cool, wet conditions for a very significant part of the year. We don't get very cold, unlike the Northeast. Um, and it's perfect for growing biennial brassicas, um, uh, very, very good. But unfortunately, it also is very favorable for black legs. So this is a picture taken of Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Oakham on the left in the brown um, and Shannon Comedy, a former graduate student in my program on the right, standing in a uh, overwintered canola crop in the Willamette Valley. And if you look up close at these leaves, you can see uh, large numbers of these leaf spots um, associated with black leg with the little fruiting bodies inside. And when we looked at an adjacent field where a canola seed crop had been grown the previous year, the stem residues that were left on that soil surface had a had tremendous number of these overwintering survival structures, which again released these spores into, into the air. 
And this is a, a photo taken that same day of our Shannon and I visiting a turnip seed crop uh, overwintering. And again, you could see just a tremendous amount of leaf spot on all over these leaves, which um, was very devastating when black leg um, broke out, an uh, epidemic pretty much broke out in the Willamette Valley that previous year in 2014. And this is a photo that Cynthia Oakham took of an overwintered organic kale seed crop. Where you can see the tremendous um, devastation to the, this um, crop um, as a result of the very favorable cool wet conditions through the winter. And he has the classic black leg symptom at the base of the stem. You can see this canker forming with these tiny little pinprick sized structures, which are the fruiting bodies. And just to give you an idea of one of the struggles with this disease is this is a, a list of a wide range of brassica hosts on which black leg was found in 2014 when the disease started showing up um, in an epidemic kind of proportion in, in 2014 after really largely having been absent for many years. And it goes to uh, just about anything in the brassicaceae that you might encounter. So weeds, uh, crops, cover crops, um, seed crops, uh, production crops. And that's one of the difficulties of this disease. Is, um, it doesn't seem to discriminate too much among the members of brassicaceae. So in, in areas like ours with mild winters, we have a tremendous amount of um, brassica weeds that can survive through the winter, which really increases the likelihood of the pathogen being able to propagate through the winter. And to, to help you be aware of how this pathogen works, um, so you might see multiple names tied to the, the, the disease black leg. Fulmer lingam is what we call the asexual stage. So many fungi have a sexual stage and an asexual stage. And unfortunately, they often are named differently just to make it really confusing for you. But you might see the name Fulmer lingam or you might see names tied to the sexual stage, which is the genus Leptosferia, and there's two different species tied to that. So unfortunately, that means you potentially encounter three different names tied to the disease black leg on brassicas. And for any of you out there that grow potatoes, you might have run across the name black leg and potatoes. And just to make it very clear, black leg on potatoes is nothing to do with this disease on brassicas. Black leg on potatoes is a bacterial disease, just to make it really confusing. So um, be careful because I've heard growers say, well, what about my potatoes? They get black leg and it's important to recognize it's not the same disease, but unfortunately has been given the same common name. So the black leg pathogen on brassicas is very readily seed borne. If you plant out infected seed, you'll often see lesions developing on the cotyledons as they emerge. Those will continue to splash and spread as the plants grow producing these uh, fruiting bodies called pycnidia. They release these asexual spores that are largely splash dispersed. So the spread tends to be more localized within field. Um, the real high risk uh, to a seed production area comes in when crops grow in, go into that um, seeding phase because they get these uh, big stems, infections on the stems then um, as the crop goes into the winter and the residues are left on the soil surface, they'll produce the second form of a fruiting body. It's the sexual stage of the fruiting body. And these ones shoot out these long, thin spores that are actually carried in the wind. So that they're not reliant on splashing, but are wind dispersed, which means potentially longer distances between fields, as opposed to the splashing stage, which tends to be largely limited within fields. And that's one of the concerns we have when black leg shows up is to try and prevent this stage from forming so that you don't potentially pose a risk to nearby fields with the inoculum of this pathogen. So as I mentioned, it goes to almost anything in the in brassicaceae. Um, it does survive on seeds for a number of years. And very importantly, it survives on crop residues, particularly the harder, woodier type of stem tissue in a seed crop. And splashing water, running surface water, the airborne sexual spores, which are also called ascospores, um, movement of seed, uh, movement on infected transplants, and even potentially machinery equipment or people walking through crops when they're wet and they're oozing these spores are, are various ways by which the fungus can spread. As I said, cool and wet is ideal. So in the Northeast, I imagine that would be in the uh, spring in particular, and also in the fall. Fungus does not tend to do that as well when it's very warm, but uh, certainly cool and wet. So how do you manage this disease if you see it? Um, it's recommended to have a fairly long rotation. And this can be quite difficult if you are in an area where you do have a lot of brassica weeds as we, as we certainly do in the Northwest through the winters. 
Um, the recommendation is to avoid wetting transplants, and this can be tough because, um, you know, when you're handling transplants, the last thing you want to do is have the transplants dry out. Um, so this, this is an important consideration to minimize those uh, little uh, fruiting bodies from continuing to produce spores in those tendrils as they get wet. And isolation of crucifer crops or brassica crops is, a, is an important recommendation because of the potential for spread between fields, but also um, where you have biennial brassicas, as we do big time in the Northwest, a lot of biennial brassica production in Western Washington and Western Oregon. You have a 16 month seed crop, for example, a biennial cabbage, it's 16 months from seed to seed. And so there's this overlapping green bridge from biennial season to biennial season that potentially increases the risk of inoculum surviving and spreading. Uh, selecting sites where you get good airflow um, around the crop to help the canopy dry out after rains or after irrigations can be valuable. There are some varieties that tend to be more resistant, um, but for many of the specialty brassicas, um, not much is known about which ones are, are, have good resistance. Controlling um, weeds in that brassicaceae can be very, very important. Um, is the, that we joke in the Northwest about the recommendation to avoid working in wet fields means you probably wouldn't be in your field eight months of the year. So it's a recommendation on paper that doesn't always translate to reality. Um, but in close inspection and roguing, removing suspect uh, plants with, with symptoms, um, submitting uh, suspect symptoms to a diagnostic lab, um, um, like Allison to, to check to see if this is a disease of concern that could be seed borne or if it's something else. And sanitation, so um, important is to get rid of infected material. Um, for there are some fungicides that can be used, both in uh, organically certified, uh, approved use of fungicides, and those for conventional growers, and um, also there are fungicides available. Perhaps one of the really important considerations for management, particularly in an area where this disease is not established is that once you harvest uh, a seed crop, a brassica seed crop, is to incorporate the residues into the soil, not leave them on the soil surface. And the reason is that those fruiting bodies can disperse spores into the air, particularly the sexual spores, only on residues that are exposed at the surface of the soil. If they're buried, um, those spores cannot be dispersed. And also residues break down much faster when they're incorporated into the soil. If you're involved with seed production or purchasing seed, um, it's really important to start with clean seed if possible. Um, if there's any question about this, um, hot water treatment of most brassica seed can be quite effective. Um, the exact temperature and duration, obviously you need to be careful because of the risk of uh, damaging that seed when you do hot water treatment. But it's a, it's a very simple, um, although um, has to be controlled very carefully, it can be very, very effective at cleaning up seed. Uh, to limit that risk of spreading on seed. And one of the criteria we really try to emphasize in our work with seed growers here in the Northwest is to uh, try and get everyone to recognize and adopt these management recommendations because of the risk if that sexual stage starts to form of the pathogen moving beyond a farm to neighboring farms. I'm gonna move on to black rot uh, briefly. Um, hopefully I have a little bit of time to cover this disease. Uh, this is um, caused, as I said, by a bacterium, Xanthomonas campestris, Pathophore campestris. And the foliar symptoms tend to be quite distinct from those of blackleg. So these are uh, three photos of some cabbage seedling, uh, leaves of cabbage seedlings we inoculated with the black rot pathogen. Um, actually, I think the bottom right is a radish leaf, but you can see that you get sort of a blackening of the veins. Um, usually with uh, yellowing or what we call chlorosis uh, around that site of infection. And the blackening of the veins will usually move down the vein and into the midrib. Uh, because this pathogen becomes systemic, it actually starts to move through the vascular tissue. The reason you often see lesions on the margin is that where the veins end at the tip of the leaf, there's a tiny opening called a hydathode. And that opening actually is a port of entry for bacteria to get into the leaf, especially after um, very dewy nights, uh, you have those little droplets of water that form on the edge of the leaf. And those little droplets of water, they're called gutation droplets. They get sucked back into the leaf as the day warms up and uh, humidity drops down and those leaflets, uh, droplets get sucked back into the leaf. And any bacteria that might be present in those droplets get sucked in. So very, very frequently the symptoms show up on the margins of the leaves, as you can see in these photos. 
This is a classic picture uh, in a field situation, and you can see those, those V-shaped lesions developing from the margin of the leaf going back towards the veins. And as the pathogen becomes systemic, you might get some blackening of the vascular tissue. There are some closely related um, pathogens that go to some of the other brassicas like radish that are actually xanthomonas campestris as well, but the pathovar, which means strains specifically pathogenic on certain varieties, are different. So Amoraceae and Arafanae are actually not the same as Anthemonas campestris, pathophar campestris. And perhaps the biggest difference is that Amoraceae and Rafanae tend not to go systemic. They tend to stay particularly as leaf spots as shown in these two photos, whereas the true black rot pathogen will go systemic. But unfortunately, all three uh, can be seed borne and seed transmitted. And so here's a, a kind of a summary of, of the, the three uh, pathogens. And you can see um, the black rod causes more of the wilting and the blackening of the veins. The others have the spotting. They all can be um, seed borne. They all are splash dispersed. Bacteria do well in wet conditions. Um, equipment or people moving in wet fields, similar to a discussion about black leg. Um, and again, similar to black leg, uh, leaving infected residues on the soil surface um, is, is one way that the pathogen will persist longer in your fields. Um, there were some studies done in Western Washington showing that the, the residues with, infected with black leg could keep inoculum, viable inoculum around for, for up to, close to a year on stems and particularly on seed crop stem residues, which are very woody, almost sometimes a couple inches in diameter. We're talking almost two years of survival. So really important to recognize infected residues are an important source of inoculum. Um, black rot tends to be favored by very warm conditions. So in the Northeast, you have warm, humid summers, which are very, very favorable to uh, diseases like black rot. Uh, the, the other two pathogens tend to do better in cool to warm, um, but with all of these moisture, wet conditions drive these pathogens. Um, they tend to have a, a fairly um, specific host range, black rot or the brassicaceae, including weeds, a lot like the black leg pathogen. Unfortunately, xanthomonas leaf spot has also been documented on tomato and pepper. Um, and so the other xanthomonas leaf spot has uh, been particularly problematic on horseradish at times. And so management of black rot, um, there's uh, many resources to find information on managing black rot. I just mentioned one that is quite valuable in the Northwest. I do know that in the Northeast, you have excellent resources through uh, websites, for example, Cornell University and others. Um, I'm sure University of Maine and others have excellent resources, extension type resources to find information on these two diseases, which are very common in, in brassicas. But again, trying to start with clean seed as best possible. Hot water treatment can also work really well um, for cleaning up seed uh, for both black rot and black leg, which is excellent. Um, rotation, rotating out of brassicas if possible, particularly for your nurseries or, or seedling transplant production, that, that's extremely important. Controlling weeds, isolation, very similar to what we discussed with black leg. Um, there are some cultivars that are more resistant. Um, this general recommendation of limiting how much work you do when fields are wet, inspection and roguing, sanitation, just like with black leg. Um, coppers tend to unfortunately be the only form of application of a bactericide that works. So um, organic coppers as well can, can help. Um, but again, similar to black leg, uh, controlling um, residues by incorporating them into the soil to limit the chance that inoculum spreads from residues on the soil surface. Uh, treating seed if need be and, and trying to help recommend regional wide adoption of management practices to limit spread among farms or fields. And with that, I think I'll stop Heron. And um, there's lots more I could go on to. I do have more slides, but I know that uh, time is of the essence with the opportunity to hear from others. So I'll stop there. Great. Uh, if folks have questions that they want to have asked at this point answered, um, put it in the chat. We'll do three or four quick questions. And one was just clarifying plant material uh, you know, infected plant material, define that. Is that all above ground plant material uh, that just including the stem that's uh, standing? 
Yes, anything um, above ground. The roots tend not to be um, a source of the spore production. Um, these fruiting bodies are sort of evolved to be exposed to air um, and you know, in order to imbibe the moisture and then release the spores through either splashing or, as I said, shooting the, the, the sexual spores out. Um, so anything above ground, um, including the base of the stem, where you very often get that canker that leads to the name blackleg, um, those are the sources of concern about survival, yes. We have a question about an alternative seed treatment. Does the soaking of seeds with bleach slash hydrogen peroxide products address these diseases on the seed itself? Um, it's a very good question. And what what the research has shown is disinfectants like um, bleach or, or hydrogen peroxide type products can, can do a very good job at reducing the level of infection. But if you have any more internal infection in seed, they tend not to get that infection. And that's why hot water treatment is, is really the best um, to have the greatest possibility of eradicating any of the more deep seeded infection in the seed. Um, and that's, it, there's just too much risk with these disinfectants of not potentially getting infection that's more recalcitrant um, because the more internal infection, the harder it is for disinfectants to get to them. And hot water in contrast penetrates into the seed and, and can kill the, the fungus. The, the difficulty there is making sure you don't go too hot or for too long because then you start to damage the seed itself. So it has to be balanced very, very carefully on temperature and duration. Question about composting. Would composting debris uh, and, and how hot do you think, would that affect or reduce this? Yeah, it's a really good question, Erin, and, and I've had this discussion with a number of our, our organic seed growers in the Northwest. Um, yes, in theory, composting is will work in terms of breaking down residues quickly, um, and, and the more thorough the composting, the better. Um, in areas like ours, where these are quarantine diseases, um, we get concerned if, if there's any risk that the disease did show up, which normally we don't have these diseases present, our recommendation is to do burial um, and not wait for that composting period to um, break down those materials because there is a delay um, during which, especially if we're getting into the shoulder rainy season in the fall, there's too much risk that we'll continue to spread from those residues. If the disease is, is established and it's more about keeping it in check, um, then that, that potentially could be okay. But in an area like ours where it's a quarantine disease, um, we, there's just too much risk, so we tend to recommend burial, if, if, if at all possible, to, if, if you're concerned that disease is there. If you're not sure or, or there's no evidence that disease is there, then um, that should be fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, delay the question about where we get seed tested, because I think that affects kind of like all of the presentations today. We'll pick that up at the end. But there is a question about companion plants that might reduce the spread of this. But it also made me wonder, should we be concerned about wild brassica weeds? Because in organic agriculture, we have a lot of those, as well as brassica cover crops, which we tend to use. What's your thoughts on how those can contribute or be hosts for this? Absolutely, and that's an excellent, excellent question. I'm really glad someone asked that question. Um, I think it, it's an extremely important consideration. We know, as I one slide I showed you, <clears throat> that listed a whole bunch of hosts on which uh, Cindy Oakham's program at Oregon State University had found blackleg when we had that epidemic occur in 2014-15. And um, just the fact that a wide range of weeds, uh, brassica weeds that, that do well in our climate in the Northwest, uh, turned out to be uh, potentially infected, I think is, is an illustration that if you do have black legs show up on your farm, uh, as, as hard as it can be to control brassica weeds organically, um, that really will go a long way towards helping reduce the inoculum buildup if you can do so. Um, cover crops um, are a really a touchy subject when it comes to brassicas and black leg. Um, we have uh, fairly strong evidence that some of the cover crop seed industry has um, been involved in accidental distribution of black leg because of sometimes a lack of awareness of these diseases that are seed borne and seed transmitted. And actually have spent a fair amount of time at the invitation of the American Seed Trade Association, uh, giving presentations and outreach to cover crop seed industry folks to raise their awareness of these diseases because 
um, there is a lot of cover cropping and, and we want cover cropping to continue because of the value of cover cropping, but to recognize the importance of producing clean cover crop seed um, so that cover crops don't become a source of inoculum for your cash crops. All right. Well, and there's a couple other questions, but I think we'll hold them because I think the plant residue pile question is reflective of a lot of the different diseases that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so thank you so much, Lindsay. And we're going to be having a Q&A at the end of this. Hopefully we'll have 15 or 20 minutes left over. Uh, we'll take it from there and we'll move on to Allison. Allison, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. Sorry, everyone. We have to have at least some issues. Okay, can you see me or see the presentation? Yes. Yep. We can. Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so my name is Allison Smart. I'm at the University of Maine. And as you heard, my job is to get diseased plants in the mail and to play with them. So I'm gonna try not to geek out and use too big a terms. Um, but there were already a lot of terms used in the first presentation, and I'm just going to kind of build on that. So in this presentation, I'm going to be looking at tomatoes and peppers. I have listed here all the fungal diseases that are seed borne on tomatoes. I have the disease name, which is on the left, and then the pathogen name, which is on the right. Uh, as you heard, Plant pathologists are kind of terrible at coming up with disease names. There's a lot of overlap. Um, and so a lot of these that are listed here can be found on a wide host range and don't necessarily cause the same type of disease, um, but we can go over that. And I'm gonna show mostly photos here so that you can pick up on the symptoms that you might see when growing these plants. So on the left, we have early blight this is a really common disease. I get this a lot in the lab, especially even homeowners will get this disease. So the symptoms that you would see would on the fruit be sunken in areas that then kind of have this um, felt like growth on it. And those are actually the spores that are forming on there that then can be taken by the wind and move the disease. Uh, the foliage will then look like brown or necrotic spots with yellowing on the outskirts of those spots sometimes. So that yellowing we call uh, chlorosis. And we can see those generally like in the center of the leaves. They can also be on the edges, but I'll show some other diseases where they're always going to be on the edge. So it's good to pick up on where those leaf spots actually are. The other indication that this is early blight is that when you look at the leaf really closely, you'll see these concentric rings, almost like a bullseye, and that's very indicative of early blight. So kind of on the right, you'll see in thracnose, and you have the fruit that's also affected, again, similar to early blight, but in this case, when it first becomes diseased and starts to show those symptoms, it's almost like someone had taken their tomato and just kind of dropped it on the ground. It gets dented. And then over time, as the, the pathogen starts to grow and take over that tissue, you get these structures, these black structures, they kind of look like eyelashes coming out of the structures. Those are called CD. Um, and as it progresses even more, you'll get these pink salmon-like area kind of um, pooling up. And that's those spores forming. So on the right, we have anthracnose, we have some pink, and then on the left, we have always gonna be kind of black, brown, velvety color. And these are all the ones that I'm covering are gonna be seed-borne diseases. Then we have septoria leaf spot. So this can be confused commonly with early blight, except the one difference in looking at these is kind of the easiest way for me to just by looking at a photo is the white center in the middle. 
indicates that a septoria leaf spot. A lot of times folks will send me photos of a disease um, prior to sending in a sample. And if I can identify it by photo, then I don't ask them to send it in. So this would be one of those instances is if I saw that white center, I would know that it's septoria leaf spot and I wouldn't ask to, to see the plant material. Also with this, you don't get those concentric rings like you would with alternaria. On the fruit though, there's a similar kind of look to it, um, except that you'll have some whitening on the tomato, similar to the leaf spot. Uh, you can get some browning, but it probably won't be as prolific as the, alternate, uh, the early blight. Sorry, I'm gonna try to use the same names throughout to not throw everyone off. On the right-hand side, you'll see late blight. Um, so kind of in contrast to early blight, but late blight is very different. So late blight will start with the leaf kind of becoming a, a light green in color and then progress to a more brown discoloration and then get fuzzy. So on the top, I have the bottom leaf and on the bottom, I have the top leaf. I probably should have switched that. Um, and you can see that you can see those symptoms on the top and the bottom. Some of the diseases that I'm gonna cover, they look very different from top to bottom, but this would be one that looks similar on both sides of it. I should also warn you that I am gonna ask some questions uh, throughout this presentation. So just to keep you on your toes and be more interactive since we're in the, the Zoom world right now. So leaf spot, I'm sure you've all seen, this is really common. We see leaf spot, the, the brown discoloration, which are the spores on the underside of the leaf. That first photo I had on my first slide, it was a zoomed in picture of those spores on the underside of a tomato leaf. You can see here that when it starts to get going, the underside of the leaf, the, the brown areas are restricted by the veins. Um, you can see those large veins, and they really don't jump over those veins. Over time, they probably will take over the entire leaf, um, but at once it starts going, it doesn't. And then on the upper portion of the leaf, you would see some yellowing, chlorosis we would call that, and it would generally be in spots, and again, restricted by those veins. So if, wherever the brown spot is on the underside of the leaf, a yellow spot will be on the top. In contrast, verticillium wilt is a disease that will cause wilting to occur. Uh, usually we see the symptoms occurring on one side of the plant. And you can see here that it's actually the symptoms of the yellowing, the chlorosis, are on one side of the leaf, restricted by that main vein going down the leaflet. So you can see here that if you were to look at the top of the leaves, if you look closely and you take your time, you can distinguish between yellow on one side versus yellow splatters of yellow. Um, the more you check your plants, the probably more comfortable you'll be with just using symptomology to diagnose. Um, and then, you know, as time goes on, even just seeing those that brown growth on the underside would be very indicative of leaf mold, which would give you the confidence that it's that rather than say verticillium that would never have that brown growth on the underside. So we also have here some stem diseases on the left hand side, if I was to cut into a tomato and kind of shave off a portion of the outer part of the stem, uh, I would see on the inside of the stem this discoloration. So we have this kind of streaking browning occurring, which isn't typical. As you know, um, the, the stem should be completely green. And so this would be fusarium wilt. It's not very commonly spread um, by seed, but it is sometimes. So I just want to throw it in there since th that is an easy symptom that you should be able to pick up. Um, you'll also get wilting for this one as well with compared to the verticillium wilt. Uh, the, the difference might be with the fusarium. When you do start to see the wilting, it will actually bounce back in the evening when temperatures uh, get a little cooler. 
uh, versus verticillium, you'll see just the decline, the wilting occurring. Um, and with both of these, you won't, during the day, if you were to water, you won't really see a bounce back um, to it. Verticillium will takes over the, the stem. They start forming these growths in the, the kind of the straw of the stem that moves the water around. And so that's why it's restricting in that area and you're seeing wilting. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna ask you a question. Uh, there's a stem here. We have some browning, some necrosis. We also have, if you look closely, some concentric rings. Do any of you know what might be the cause of this? It's a fungal disease. We've already covered it. Similar to the leaf symptoms. So if anyone has any guesses, feel free to put them in the chat. It's okay. You can guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you can guess wrong too. So we have a few. I'll give it another minute for people to write in. Okay, I'm seeing a couple a uh, couple replies. Some guessing late blight and some guessing early blight. So far okay. are the two most common. Perfect. So you got the last word right, blight. So you've all identified that it's most likely a blight and you're correct in thinking that, um, but it's early blight. So early blight, remember I showed you the leaf spot. You'll have those concentric rings. You can kind of see it um, in some areas here, those rings. It's not the greatest photo, probably because I made it smaller, um, but just like those leaf spots, you can also get concentric rings on the stem. Usually you see that when the disease is more progressed, um, but that would be also an indicator of early blight. Late blight, you would not see those concentric rings. Again, you would see that white fluffiness on the leaf, um, and then you would really just start to see browning and necrosis and, and dying of the stems, and it would be quite rapid. Allison, we have a question uh, in the chat that's kind of related. Uh, the question is, is it possible for early blight to only affect the foliage and not the fruit of the tomato? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So depending on the time of year that you get the disease and it starts to show symptoms, so that's one one part of it. So the time of year, also depending on the environment, if we, we say if the environment is conducive for that disease, then it will progress much quicker. So it likes moist environments. So if maybe you had a spell of rain and then it got warm and then dry, then it will, it will stop. It basically won't spread. So your fruit is probably safe at that point if it's not already on it. Um, and then another piece is if you have some tolerance, meaning that you have seed, uh, you have a plant that can have a little bit of the symptoms on it and can get it on the foliage, but your fruit is safe because it does have some degree of tolerance to that disease. So yeah. All right, any other, is, was that it? The um, there was one question that just came in and it is, can necrotic pith be seed borne? Oh, okay. Um, no. So perfect. Thanks for asking. We are on tomato bacteria seed borne diseases. So these are the bacteria diseases that are seed borne. So the one that was just mentioned is a bacterial disease. Um, and we will go into those. Lindsay had also mentioned Xanthomonas, uh, and that on this particular plant is called bacterial leaf spot. It's also on the one that she had mentioned. So you'll, you might see these different names, which is terribly confusing. I realize it. I have a little trick uh, that I formed when I was in school. X marks a spot. So Xanthomonas starts with an X, and then the uh, disease name is bacterial leaf spot. Um, but we'll also cover bacterial spec and bacterial canker as well. Okay, so bacterial canker. These, so these symptoms are a little more difficult to 
identify than the, the fungal diseases. So I do recommend that if you see some of these and you're unsure um, or you want to even confirm to send it to your diagnostic lab, like Lindsay had said, but I pulled out the ones that are easier to identify, I'll say, with these symptoms. So bacterial canker doesn't always form these symptoms that you're seeing on the tomato with the white ring around those little spots on the fruit. But when you see that, you can probably say it's bacterial canker. Um, so remember, white ring around bacterial canker on tomato. Uh, and then bacterial speck on the leaves, you would see really small kind of pinpoint, larger, a little larger than pinpoint spots on the leaf. Um, so that will be speck. And speck is always going to have a smaller leaf spot than spot. So, and the same is true for the fruit. I couldn't find a good fruit photo for bacterial speck, um, but bacterial spot will be slightly larger. Um, and you can see when looking at these two different fruit, the lower photo, even though it's more ripe, you don't have that white ring around it like you would see with bacterial canker. But again, feel free to send any samples to a diagnostic lab to identify these since bacteria are, are more of a problematic child. And viruses, and viruses are even more. Um, so these are the viruses you saw on tomato that you'll see, alfalfa mosaic virus, tomato mosaic virus, double virus streak, cucumber mosaic virus. The ones that are underlined are the ones that we'll also discuss under uh, pepper. So they go to both tomato and pepper just because they're solanaceous. Um, they usually get similar diseases. Whenever you see a virus or you think you have a virus, the first thing you want to do is just get rid of that plant. Uh, there's nothing you can do when you have a virus. Um, so just simply roguing it, pulling it out, and getting rid of that plant material. And really, the symptomology for viruses are all things funky anything that looks really super weird. So this photo here, cucumber mosaic virus, we have a tomato plant that is having really small uh, leaves, they're twisting, they're curling. It almost looks like someone came by with some herbicide um, and you got some, some drift symptoms going on, but really it's just the virus. Oftentimes it's difficult to identify herbicide damage to viruses. So now we're gonna to transition to pepper seed diseases. Um, and the two here that I have, I have anthracnose fruit rot. So we already covered anthracnose on tomatoes uh, and then bacterial leaf spots. So we've already covered these. So these photos, well, geez, okay, yeah. It kind of gives itself away because bacterial leaf spot, obviously it's the leaf. I didn't even think of that until now giving this presentation. But that is anthracnose fruit rot. Remember, it has that salmon colored spores that are forming. And it almost looks like, again, that, that pepper was dropped on its side. So you have that flat spot. And then bacterial leaf spot. So we have these, you know, kind of nondescript leaf spots here. They might be water soaked. Often, cases, whenever you get a bacteria, it's going to be water soaked. Um, and as you can see, they go to both tomato and pepper. Pepper viruses, we have similar ones, cucumber mosaic, tomato mosaic, and alfalfa mosaic virus also go to tomatoes. Um, and then pepper mild model virus and tobacco mosaic virus, um, they go just to the pepper plant. You don't have to worry about them on your tomato. But again, funky symptoms here. So it almost looks like on the, the photo of alfalfa, alfalfa mosaic virus that you know, maybe there's some genetics that are going on causing those light areas. Um, but in this case, it's actually a virus causing those yellow spots. Um, mosaic pattern is what we would call it. And then you can see on the lower photo, cucumber mosaic virus, you just have chlorotic yellow blotches uh, occurring. So whenever you see those, again, pulling them out, getting rid of them. 
Okay, so I went over the symptomology and I, I, I didn't go over really any of the management because if you can identify what you have, you have the ability to figure out what to do. Um, so this is me kind of pointing you in the right direction. This is a PDF that is online. If you just simply Google tomato seed borne diseases, this will come up. These are all the vegetable crop seed borne pathogens that you should be aware of. Um, this is actually from Cornell. If you wanted to go to the direct link, you can take a photo of this slide um, and it's right at the top, really long though. Uh, and it lists all the ones that you wanna make sure that you're not um, getting and, and spreading. Also, I noticed in the chat during Lindsay's presentation, someone asked about organic uh, pesticide sprayed for, I think it was blackleg. So I have this book here right in front of me and I looked it up and it does list an organic pesticide. I strongly recommend that you use this. This is an amazing resource um, housed at UMass. It's updated every two years. Um, I'm going to I actually have a meeting today about talking about updating the disease portion of this. We update it every two years to make sure that new products are listed. It lists all the, the um, pesticides that are allowed to be used on particular diseases. You can get it online for free or you can buy the book. Um, it's about over 300 pages. It's a good investment to have um, for you guys, and, and there's really great descriptions on there. This is also a really great um, for photos. Rather than just Googling, mm, you know, the pepper leaf spot, you're probably going to get some weird things coming up that actually aren't potato leaf spot. I recommend using this website. It's called Bugwood, um, but this is the direct link to looking at commodities. So for this case, you would click vegetables and then you would, I picked pepper in this situation and then I open up the filter on the left-hand side and then I say pepper leaf spot and then it will show all the leaf spots for pepper. The great thing about this website is that only scientists can upload the photos that have been approved and then other scientists check those photos to make sure that they have been identified correctly. So you know any photo that has those numbers on the bottom, which you can see right there, came from this website, which I got all my photos from, and they've been approved for what they're listed as but realize that if someone was to use one of these photos and put it on a website, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have listed it correctly. So you'd wanna go reference it to that website. I've said a couple times that you should send your samples to a diagnostic lab. So you might be wondering, you know, depending on what state you're from, you might not be from Maine. So where do I send that? You can go to this website here you can select the state that you live in and it will tell you the contact information for the diagnostic lab in your state. Every single state has a diagnostic lab and I recommend using them. And real quick, I think I have two minutes. Uh, if you have garlic diseases, uh, my lab will test for bloat nematode, white rot and botrytis neck rot. Um, I send out a report with if it was clean of these diseases um, that then folks can can use when selling garlic. So I just want to throw that up there as well. And this is my contact information. Awesome, Allison. We have um, a couple questions. Would it be possible at the end of this to put some of the links that you had just right into the chat for people? Okay, awesome. And then um, there was a question from a little bit earlier that was for early blight or any uh, or any disease. If it's not on the fruit, is it also not in the seed? An excellent question. Lindsay, I'm calling a friend here. Uh, I I honestly don't have. Yeah, I'm going to defer that to Lindsay. <laughs> I think I think the um, for pathogens that cause spotting type of symptoms like early blight and so on um, that affect from the external of the fruit, if you're not seeing symptoms, you're not 
likely to see infection on the seed. The, the caveat to that is some of these pathogens that are in the vascular tissue, like the verticillium welts or the uh, black rots and so on, they can potentially move up the vascular tissue and get into seed through that route. Um, so you may not see symptoms on, on that specific fruit or on that specific pod, depending on the species, but potentially could get infection. But I suspect if, if there was enough disease for it to move that systemically, that you should be seeing symptoms somewhere on the plant, potentially not that individual fruit, but somewhere on that plant, like wilting or, or some other symptoms that should give it away that there's something uh, potentially wrong with that plant that you might want to keep an eye on. But that would be my only thought of where you might not see symptoms externally on the fruit, but potentially could get infected seed. Awesome, thank you. Um, let me just make sure. So there's another follow-up question to that. Um, does that include just the fruit or or would you need to inspect the petiole and calyx? Could it enter the seed tissue through the green tissue near the fruit? Maybe Lindsay can reply to that. Yeah, good question. And <clears throat> we have, for example, I'm just thinking uh, we, we didn't cover onions um, just because of time, but um, a number of the onion pathogens that I've worked with, um, like botrytis, which can be seed borne. Um, usually when, when the, the difficulty in some of these naked um, vegetables that have naked seeds, they're not enclosed in a fruit, they, they naturally have to senesce to finish maturing. And it's during that senescing phase when the crop is dying, it's going through its natural death, um, that you can also potentially get colonization by pathogens. So you might not see the symptoms because they come in late, but, but you potentially could still get infection. So we can see, for example, botrytis colonization of onion seed um, after that umbel starts to senesce and you don't necessarily see symptoms because that senescence masks the presence of the pathogen. So that would be one case I could also think of um, as I kind of, it, it's getting beyond fruit because it's a naked seed that naturally has to senesce um, and many of these pathogens cause that, when I say senescence, that dying tissue, you got natural dying and then you've got pathogen induced dying. And if they're occurring around the same time, they could be masking each other. So that'd be one thing to keep an eye on. But certainly with Elizabeth's question about where do you inspect, um, you know, something like uh, one of these wilt pathogens that are moving through the, the vascular tissue. Um, in my experience, if they're going to get all the way up to the fruit or the pods or whatever structure that your vegetable might have, by then you normally are seeing some kind of symptoms in the plant. I don't know, Alison, if you want to comment further on that. Yeah, no, I am thinking about this a little more. Yeah, it, it's a hard, it's a hard threshold to know um, because really you can only rely on the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are, there are some pathogens where, the, you know, you can get infection without very distinct symptoms, but the majority tend to be pretty obvious when, by the time you're going to get seed infection, it's pretty obvious that the plant's infected, thankfully. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to hold questions there for a second and move on to Sue. Hi, um, can you see my slides and hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks, it's good to be here. Um, it's fun to be here with Allison and Lindsay because we had lunch together right before the beginning of the pandemic talking about, I think, spinach seed diseases. So um, it's kind of funny and I am here from UMass. Um, these are pictures from my uh, the research farm where I do um, applied research trials. This is a spray trial of um, winter squash and um, presenting about an experiment using flowers to attract beneficial insects um, to Brussels sprout fields here. So um, uh, my, my role here at UMass is to work with vegetable farmers broadly on any issues that they have and do educational workshops and stuff. Um, but I also really enjoy doing these research trials and 
and being out in the field myself. So that's kind of what I do. And this is my contact info here. Um, you can always feel free to send email with questions or a photo of diseases. Um, so I, I got interested in plant pathology. I worked on an organic farm in the valley in 2009, which is the year that we had a huge late blight outbreak in tomato and potato and it totally wiped out our tomato crop and I was really impressed by that and decided to um, go to school and I got a master's in plant pathology um, and I studied alternaria and brassicas while I was there and um, then I came back to Massachusetts and have been working for UMass Extension um, since then so that's kind of introduction to me. I'm going to talk about diseases of beans and spinach, sort of random um, combination, but I was thinking beans because there's definitely a lot of interest these days in growing our own local beans, and um, it's, it's one of the few crops that we grow for seed in that the seed is the consumed crop. Um, but we don't do a lot of seed production in the Northeast. Um, mostly, I think it's too humid here. We get a lot of disease. So um, in the case of beans, most bean seed is grown in the West where it's drier. Um, and so it's, it's just sort of a niche crop now that folks are getting back into especially like heirloom varieties of beans. So um, I'm going to talk about these four diseases. And they're grouped like this because these first two are fungi and these are bacterial. And I, they behave differently, so I like to talk about them together. So it makes sense to me. So I think anthracnose is probably the most common disease I've seen in beans in the Northeast. So the symptoms are, and it should sound familiar now because Allison did a great job talking about it in tomato and pepper, but here on bean, the symptoms on the leaf are these small little blackened spots that occur just on the veins, um, some on the petioles or stems as well, but it's sort of a funky distribution of spots, which really stands out, um, not like anything else. And then we have on um, the on the pods, you get again those sunken dark spots. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, in the center of the spot, if conditions are humid um, or wet, you might see the spores exuding and they are, are pinkish or then they dry and are kind of crusty brown. So that is how the fungus gets into the seed and then you can see these seeds have some blemishes. So um, this disease is most common on dry beans and snap beans but other beans are also affected. Um, and seed is a really important way that it is spread. Uh, anthracnose, like other anthracnose fungi, is favored by um, sort of cool, wet weather. Um, the disease usually starts from the seeds and then spreads up the plant, um, and then the pods are infected last, and um, that's what I have about anthracnose, and I think that's probably the most important one and the one that we see most commonly. I want to talk about chocolate spot for a second. It's sort of a special case maybe, but um, fava bean is also becoming a little more popular to grow around here, at least in Massachusetts. I know a lot of folks are growing fava beans, um, but they're really susceptible to this chocolate spot, which is very dramatic. I don't, it's hard to find good pictures, but like the whole plant and eventually is covered in this wet, dark, sludge looking stuff. And it's uh, fungus and the, the spots start out small and red brown, but eventually the entire plant and the pods are covered by these 
dark velvety spores. And so this one survives also in the soil, but it can be in the seed as well. And again, being the fungus kind of cool, wet conditions favor disease. And if you get disease at flowering, you can end up with the flowers aborting and um, having decreased yield because of that. Um, I'm going to talk just about these two. There's two bacterial diseases that are, um, I guess, the most important ones. They're, I, I've never seen them in the field, but um, I think they're controlled well by um, because where the seed is grown, they're controlled well, um, just because, as I mentioned, the conditions are dry. So these um, bacterial diseases are, are less. So um, this is a Xanthomonas. Common blight is called, caused by Xanthomonas bacteria, a couple different species probably. This is getting reorganized, I think, these um, species here. But suffice it to say, they're Xanthomonas bacteria that are causing these um, kind of splotchy dead patches with a bright yellow halo on the leaf. So that is pretty striking. The symptoms on the pods are like start out as this water soaking spots and then they, as it progresses, they turn darker, um, but not very diagnostic. This is halo blight, which is caused by a different bacterium, a pseudomonas. And you can see the symptoms on the pod end up kind of similarly, like water soaked and then a brown spot. So I wouldn't use pod symptoms to distinguish these in the field. The symptoms on the leaves, though, look quite different. So here's a small spot with more of a large yellowing area. So just to show you again, this is this sort of more splotchy dead patch with a bright yellow, tight halo, and then sort of this smaller spot with a bigger area of yellowing. So the bacterial diseases, they're going to behave similarly. They come in on the seed and then are spread by water, really. So rain splash or um, rain driven by wind or overhead irrigation, and also workers or equipment in the field. And they're favored by warmer and humid conditions than the fungal diseases. So that's what you would see in the field. Um, so the best uh, course for managing um, all these diseases really is to look for um, clean seed. And so if, if you're growing your own beans and saving seed from year to year, periodically just like take a good look at that and make sure you're not um, carrying over these diseases from year to year in your field and think about, um, you know, if disease is building up, then getting fresh seed from one of these places that um, are better able to control these diseases just with the environmental conditions. So certainly if you see any of these symptoms in the field on the foliage or on the pods, don't save seeds from those pods. Um, clean and sanitize your packing areas as those can be sources of spores or bacteria. Um, managing them in the field, don't work in the um, fields when they're wet because you can spread things with the water, especially the bacteria, but also fungal diseases. Um, and if there's an area of the field that is worse off than other parts, work in the clean areas first and then um, the messy parts last so that you're not spreading the pathogens around. Um, incorporate the residues quickly after you harvest. Just get that stuff breaking down. Um, the pathogens, whether they're um, fungi or bacteria, are going to survive on that residue. So the quicker it breaks down 
the shorter your crop rotation period would have to be, um, unless there's something like an overwintering structure present. Um, so in general, a two-year rotation was recommended for all these diseases except for the chocolate spot, which does make an overwintering structure as sclerotia. So those can last a little bit longer. So if you have um, fava beans with chocolate spot, a four-year rotation is recommended. And uh, lastly, some of these diseases, there are varieties with resistance or, or at least more tolerant to disease. So check that in the catalogs, seed catalogs. Um, hot water seed treatment. Um, so far, everything we've been um, talking about so far, you can use hot water seed treatment to, um, to eradicate pathogens on or in seed with hot water. It's not recommended for beans and the reason is they're too big. So in order for the center of the bean to reach a high enough temperature to kill those pathogens, um, the, seed, the bean would die. So um, it's not recommended. You could, as we talked about a little bit, um, use sort of a, a sanitizer to um, clean things off the exterior of the seed. But if you have a true seed infestation of the inside of the tissue, um, then those sanitizers aren't gonna get in there like Lindsay said. So um, there's a few other like major bean diseases um, that aren't seed borne. And so I'm not gonna talk about them, but acknowledge that white mold exists and is very gross and difficult and Phytophthora blight exists and is also quite gross on beans and um, not seed born, but soil born um, bo in both of those cases. And there are some viruses, mostly bean yellow mosaic virus, but it's thought that um, wild hosts are the most important source of that virus. So that's what I had to say about beans. And then move on to spinach, unless you want me to stop and answer any question here. Um, there was a question about, um, sorry, let me find it, uh, organic treatments for anthracnose and snap beans. Um, yeah. Are there any effective organic treatments for an anthracnose and snap beans? I think that if you caught it really early and you didn't have a massive infestation, um, what, so caught it early meaning like just starting to see some on the leaves, I would um, try a copper. They tend to be the most effective organic fungicides. Um, so if anything was gonna work, that would be at the top of the list. Um, but not, so, not, not the best strategy for anthracnose, really just starting with clean seed and rotating into a fresh field is best. Sue, I wondered if we might like catch up on some questions on the Q&A overall, and then if we have time, come back to spinach. Is that, would that be okay with you? Sure. This Do you want is... me to stop sharing here or? Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing for just a minute and let's see if we, let's do our sort of Q&A portion. I, uh, Emily and I have both captured some questions that, uh, that address, that kind of affect a lot of what you're all sharing. Um, but if folks have, this is kind of the Q&A portion. So if folks have stuff they wanna throw in the chat, um, but let's just talk about that seed tested where and, um, wh and what's the laws around that? I know Lindsay, you were talking about a quarantine uh, in a certain area, but I wonder, and Allison, you mentioned sort of where we get things tested, more like sam leaf samples, but in terms of seeds specifically, does anyone want to kind of share that? So I'd be happy to jump in unless uh, Sue or Allison would like to go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's forwarding me on. Okay. Um, 
It's a, it's a really good question. There are not very many labs, unfortunately, that have the technical background or the resources or experience with, with some of these uh, plant diseases to do seed testing. And seed testing has um, some very unique aspects that um, really are, are extremely important to be able to produce results that have um, robustness in terms of confidence and, and limited risk of false positives or false negatives outside of things like sampling error. Um, and so it's even fewer labs that are certified to offer certain seed testing. So I, I mentioned this because if you're selling seed into certain areas where there are quarantines and there are phytosanitary requirements, then it's important <clears throat> that you get your seed tested at a lab that is um, qualified to do that testing. And some states require only labs that have been audited and certified by the National Seed Health System. So Iowa State University runs and manages the National Seed Health System for the USDA. It's, it's a national program, federal program run by USDA, but it's managed by Iowa State University's Seed Science Center. And they audit labs, seed testing labs, to make sure they uh, know how to run certain seed tests correctly particularly for things like export of seed, but also for selling seed into states that have um, fairly strict phytosanitary requirements. So here in the Northwest, because it is a very, very important area for seed production for so many vegetables, there are requirements <clears throat> from either places like Idaho, Washington State, Oregon State, um, that seed, for example, bean seed coming in um, or um, brassica seed coming in must be tested for certain pathogens and some states require the lab be audited by the National Seed Health System. So be aware of that and, and I only know of really three labs that to a large degree are uh, have gone through a lot of that auditing and testing for most vegetable seed borne pathogens. Um, and those three labs um, are the Iowa State University lab Eurofins SCA labs in Colorado and California Seed and Plant Lab that, that have, have gone through a lot of the NSHS, the National Seed Health System auditing. That doesn't mean you have to use those labs, but um, they have a lot more years of experience and technical background in many of these seed borne pathogens of vegetables. Um, there are, as I said, other labs as well. Um, there's a lot of state labs, um, but not all state labs are audited. Um, there's a fee to being audited so that prohibits some companies or some labs from getting um, audited because of that cost. Uh, so don't want to exclude those labs either, but just recognize that depends on where you're selling the seed um, as to what you may or may not be allowed to do in terms of which lab can, can run the test for you. I don't know if that's an indirect answer, Heron, but hopefully it helps. Yeah, I, I know Fedco, we use the Idaho um, lab um, partly because, and this is just a heads up to other seed companies and other seed growers, that so basically to have somebody grow bean seed for us in, in Idaho, we have to get the stock seed tested yep. before we can send them to that to the grower. And it often behooves us to have that grower continue to grow that specific variety because we would have to get the same, a new batch of stock seed tested every time. Yep. So that's just sort of like to think about how contracting seed might work if you're having beans grown elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I didn't, sorry, Heron, I didn't yeah. mention the Idaho State Department of Ag's lab, but they, they are very uh, well um, resourced expertise wise and, and equipment and so on to do a lot of um, these vegetable seed plants, especially beans. That's a big, big crop for them. Yeah, and I think in terms of finding out their testing requirements or quarantine requirements, if you have a quarantine in your region, your, your Department of Agriculture for your state would basically be the place that would know whether your area has some kind of quarantine or restriction. And usually those are fairly easy to find or at least just give a call to, or an email to your state pathologist folks. They should be able to tell you. Um, question well, about, I, go ahead, yep, go can ahead. Can I just add, so that NPDN website, when you click your state, the diagnostician comes up and then your state regulators also come up. So those are direct contacts where you can ask those specific questions. Great, thanks Alice. So, a couple questions about um, tomato seeds, Allison, and anyone else. Um, what are your thoughts about the access for the use of tomato fermentation to extract seed? Does that reduce certain types of diseases? And the sort of proper fermentation, do you have any sense of, is there 
Is there something we need to make sure we're, we're clear about what is proper fermentation? Or is there some way to know whether the fermentation process has been thorough enough to extract tomato seed in a way that um, reduces disease uh, in the on the you know in that process, do you have any thoughts about that or experience with that? Yeah, so I am not going to pretend that I am the seed woman. Uh, Lindsay is the seed king queen, so I am deferring this to her once again. I'm I, I yeah. Why answer when there's someone better fit? So sorry, Lindsay. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Allison. I I think that the the one caveat I'll, I'll offer, and I hate to say this, but I. I my, in my job, I work on dry seeded vegetables only. Um, I, I, unfortunately, so I have a lot less experience herring with um, wet seeded vegetables like the uh, solanaceous and um, cucurbit uh, species. So I don't have any direct experience with these, but we do know that the fermentation process can be pretty uh, good at knocking down a number of pathogens on seed, but it's not prevent all seed borne pathogens from you know, persisting on seed. So in tomato, for example, the um, bacterial wilt pathogen, um, you know, can be the, the amount of infection on a seed lot is significantly reduced by that fermentation process. Particularly, seed usually goes through an acid treatment, um, and that can be quite effective at knocking the infection levels down, but doesn't necessarily fully eradicate. And and so um, that's where it, I, I'd be hesitant to rely solely on that process. Um, particularly if you do a fermentation, but not an acid treatment. Um, there's quite a bit of work. Again, I haven't, no, I haven't dived into the literature because I don't work on these wet seeded vegetables, but showing that the acid treatment can, can obviously it's a pretty harsh treatment. It does a lot to kill many pathogens on seed, but not necessarily all or not necessarily completely. So um, just be aware that don't, don't rely solely on that to, to get rid of diseases. Um, okay, and I think that's sort of that question. There was a question here about traditional, does anyone know of either non-chemical or more traditional germination sort of tr like treatments for soaking seeds that might eliminate pathogens? And I will just kind of share a couple that I know of from a sort of anecdotal experience. One is when we're talking acid, basically acetic acid, which is basically vinegar. So, you know, I don't have a lot of experience using that, but basically there's been a lot of research with acetic acid, different types of vinegar origin type chemicals to treat seed. So that might be, there's probably literature about there, out there. Uh, and uh, Sue has been putting some information in the chat about hot water. Uh, mm -hmm. My brother-in-law uh, from the Middle East uh, shared with me that uh, they have a basically rolling seeds in olive oil, uh, that may also also have been included with sulfur, just powdered sulfur. It would, was their traditional technique. And again, these are not necessarily things that um, I would recommend because they don't fall under kind of like the use of product guidelines. I'm just sharing more what a traditional community might do that there may very well be extracts of roots or plants that are in counter or uh, what have you. And I wonder if do any of you know of any research into these areas um, that folks are doing in pathology. You know, Heron, there's been a lot of work over the years looking at various ways to treat seed. <clears throat> and what, what we find is that many of these treatments that you've mentioned uh, can work quite well against inoculum that resides very on the surface of the seed. And some pathogens are much more superficial in how they infect seed and other pathogens, or depending on when the seed gets infected during that seed development phase, might be infected quite internally. And those treatments, that you, the kinds of things you've mentioned tend to work against what's on the surface, but they don't get to what's inside the seed. And that's where um, it may vary depending on the pathogen. It may also vary on even with it for a particular pathogen when that seed became infected as to how internal that infection becomes. And those internal infections are the ones that tend not to get affected by those kinds of treatments because they don't penetrate that deeply. Um, at, even if they're fairly good antifungal or antibacterial agents. And that's the trouble um, that, you know, things like black leg or black rot or um, some of the pathogens that Allison and Sue mentioned, if they're more deep seated inside that seed, uh, those kinds of treatments are not gonna work, not gonna hold up. Two questions that seem to be really key to our organic community 
um, are the, again the question about how do we might use uh, the heat of the compost pile or tarping uh, debris. Um, does you know where do we have to be thinking about how that heat getting to to compromise most of these uh, issues? And the other question is kind of grounding off that companion pro uh, crop element is are there cover crops that reduce the presence of these types of diseases? Um, and I think soil diseases are probably more appropriate to that, but are there any companion plants? or cover crops that uh, can be used inter-row or what have you, or maybe just addressing soil diseases overall. I know that's not what we're talking about today, but maybe just any thoughts about that. Um, I don't know, Allison, let's see you want to chime in or, or you want me to go ahead? <laughs> well, I know that we're like at our time right now and kind of unrelated, I saw a question here that I just did research on. So I just want to throw this out there about the overwintering. Our, our winters in the Northeast have <laughs> become not so wintry uh, as we sit here with very little snow. Um, and I recently just did research about how volunteer plants are really a source of inoculum for particular diseases and, and weeds as well. So we can't really rely on our harsh winters anymore for kind of breaking that cycle, especially when we have hoop houses going up left and right, kind of bridging that gap between season to season. Um, and then there was also the question about, uh, you know, high temperatures and compost. Certainly we know that there are diseases that break down in high um, temperatures, but some of the ones that we really didn't mention, you know, they form structures that here in the lab, I can flame them, meaning like I can take a piece of their overwintering structure, flame them, put them on media, and they are very happy to grow because I just killed everyone else that might be a competitor and now they can persist. So a flame doesn't kill some diseases to kind of put some perspective on that, which is scary. Fun. And I think that the idea of um, one of the best ways to sort of break down some of these survival structures is that microbial process that happens in the soil of microbes colonizing those residues and breaking it down. And, and so those types of organisms that aren't naturally long-term soil born um, <clears throat> many of the foliar pathogens that don't persist in soil in the absence of host residue. And that's why um, getting residues into the ground where the microbes can do their thing to help break down, it takes time. So there's a risky period, of, if, especially if those residues are, are exposed on the soil surface where you could continue to get dispersal. But um, yeah, like Allison said, there, these uh, pathogens have evolved to survive these adverse conditions. Um, and they, I, one of the things I really like to try and keep in mind when I think about seed-borne pathogens, seed is a dormant structure, a survival structure of the of the, the plant, and many of these fungi form some kind of a dormant survival structure of these bacteria that they've evolved to be in sync with the seed. So the seed is in this dormant recalcitrant state to survive, and so is the pathogen. And so <clears throat> that's the challenge we face: is that it's in that more recalcitrant phase, as it's in its survival stage. And that can is, is where it becomes difficult to try and manage it. It's not as vulnerable when it's actively growing. Well, we're at time, folks, and I think this has been amazing. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying with us, and thank you for our three experts. Um, and Lindsay, you are everyone doesn't realize Lindsay's if she didn't mention is phoning or videoing in for three hours earlier. Uh, so she's coming with all the fire here, uh, very fresh in the morning. You must love coffee because I couldn't have done that. Um, and so everybody, you know, I know there's tons of questions. I think one of the things is just following up on that is like, yes, one of the value we do have is our living soil in the organic system. You know, so there's a certain place where uh, living soil does have that ability to act on these diseases uh, more than a sterile or less vital soil. So we should keep that in mind that that is one of our first defenses. Um, but thank you both. So all three of you so much. Um, we'll sure we'll have to ask you all back for like a five hour extended version. Um, but thank you, everyone. Let's give them a, give a big round of applause. 
Uh, and uh, thanks to Anna Muhammad for shepherding us today. And Emily, you wanna say a few words real quick? Um, I just put this in the chat, but if people have questions that they still wanna ask, feel free to email me. Um, it's e stark, S-T-E-S-T-A-R-C-K at johnnyseeds.com. And I can um, send those questions to the various experts we uh, heard from today or any other experts you might have. So feel free to do that. Yeah, let's, uh, and everybody, if you want to put an eval in at the uh, conference app, please do. We'd love to hear it. if you liked this session, we can do more of this type of thing. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Be you. well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to see you guys. Bye-bye. Anna, you got the controls. Send us home.